Hello, welcome to 15 Minutes in the Forest. My name is Adam Downing and I'm an Extension Forester with Virginia Cooperative Extension. I'm pleased to be with you today while we talk about Fimmelschlag. It's a neat word, captures the attention. It's a German word for a system that the Germans have come up with to help regenerate oak trees, which is real important for us here in the eastern United States, where oak has been a dominant species in the forest systems and an important species for a number of reasons. So you might be wondering why oak? Why is it important? It's not just about timber. It is an important timber species for sure. It's also a super important wildlife species. The acorns, which is a type of nut that the, what we call the nut that the uh, oaks make, is a very important hard mast species for many wildlife. It's also important for numerous uh, insects of which bird species then feed on. So it's really a keystone species in our systems and we're having trouble regenerating oak trees uh, for a number of reasons and we'll talk about some of those in the video that follows. I just want to set the stage a little bit for you. This video, the majority of this video is recorded on uh, April 21st, so it was before leaves were out and it was a windy day. So be ready to adjust the volume especially with the first visitor that I will be uh, talking with about, uh, about Femmelschlag. And I'm here in a gap that uh, was created naturally, which is what the Femmelschlag is supposed to do. And so this gap, you can see, has resulted in tremendous oak regeneration. Almost all of this is white oak that you see behind me. And it's over my head, which we call that advanced regeneration, which means it has a very good chance of being in the overstory and the new forest uh, to, to come. And this was created by a gap. In the case of this uh, location, we have a dead tree now that is right behind me. If I pan up, you can see the space that that has created in the canopy. And that is essentially what we're doing with Fimmelschlag. Um, the difference between it and our more traditional silvicultural systems is that it is an expanding gap. So you create the first gap, and then you expand on that. Whether the first gap is a circle or strips, which we'll talk about here in a little bit, but you expand on that with a permanent road network system. So it's a little bit of an upfront investment for the landowner, but uh, has promise of, of, um, of dividends in, in the future. And so, hope you enjoy the rest of this video. I'm at McCormick Farm. It's also called the Shenandoah Valley Agriculture Research Extension Center uh, near Rayfine, Virginia. Uh, actually, the county line of Augusta and Rockbridge, you go right through this farm, it's a historic farm. But we're in the woods, so there's about uh, a thousand acres total on the farm here of, uh, of land, and it's used for a variety of uh, research and demonstration uh, work uh, for agricultural producers, and we're doing a lot here with forestry as well. And so we're in one of the stands, uh, forest stands, hardwood stands here at uh, McCormick Farm. And I've got a few people here with me today. And one of them is Jerry Creighton with the Virginia Department of Forestry. Jerry's a research forester with the Department of Forestry located in their headquarters in uh, Charlottesville. And uh, so we're in this uh, stand. And Jerry, if you could just kind of describe what this stand is like. How would you describe this stand? Well, it's a, it's a mixed hardwood stand, Adam, and it's... Uh probably 130, 140 years or more old. The overstory is dominated by oaks, uh, some, if not many, of which are beginning to decline and die out. So there almost is no understory because uh, one of the factors at play here is deer population. And uh, herbivory by deer has reduced the regeneration of the problem. So the primary focus of our meeting here today is to talk about what can we do about this, a stand that's declining, there's no next forest in place to replace it. So the buzzword, I guess, for today's topic is Femmelschlag, which is a German system that essentially can be thought of as expanding gaps. Oak species are mid-tolerant of shade, so they don't require full sunlight, and they don't prosper in shade. If we were to completely remove the overstory in this stand, shade intolerant species like yellow poplar, black cherry, tolerant species like red maple would probably predominate. So we need to think of ways to create intermediate light levels. And this expanding gap uh, approach would accomplish that. The idea is to create small openings in the forest along the edges of which there would be intermediate light levels. Okay, 
Okay, so basically we've got a lot of oak in this stand right now. And oak is a desirable tree for a lot of reasons. It's a desirable timber tree. It's desirable for wildlife. It has, I think it also kind of just captures people. You know, it's a tree with history and with longevity. Okay, so we've got a forest with a lot of oak in the overstory. You can see some of these bigger. When we say overstory, we're meaning trees that are in the top, okay? But Over like this one that we see behind us, that's a, that's a big tree. So that is one that's in the overstory. But we don't see any little baby oak trees in the understory, at least not right here. And so that's one thing that we're really going for. And this is a problem you know, throughout most of Virginia. Not just Virginia, much of the hardwood forest range over generation is as the stands age and mature and we see a deficiency in over generation. It's, it's a concern region wide. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, Jerry. Sure. I'm going to move over here to David Carter. David Carter is a professor of silviculture at Virginia Tech. And uh, he's come up here today to take a look at this. And, and we've been talking about the Fimmelschlag thing here. Uh, it's a topic that he's uh, interested in. And uh, we're maybe, we're hoping to take on a little research project with this. Yeah. Talk to us a little bit about that, David. Sure. Um, so what we have outlined so far is testing both um, gaps as strips and gaps as your kind of plastic roots. Um, Let me stop you there. By gaps, we're talking about what? Taking some trees out? Is that right? That's okay. right. So harvested patches that may vary in size from about a half acre to an acre. Okay. Um, and in general, what informs the size of that gap should be the regeneration cohort or the pool of seedlings that you have on the forest floor. Okay. So you're basically trying to remove that overstory to recruit that understory layer. Um, um, the original intention of utilizing these groups, expanding them uh, over where uh, regeneration had been recruited, um, is that it largely mimics what you see naturally. Oftentimes we have some sort of disturbance that would create a group um, or a gap. And then along that edge of that gap, your mid-tolerant species like oaks would kind of proliferate. They do really well there. You continue to expand that gap um, in the direction of that regeneration. And that itself also kind of mimics what we have naturally. Where you have a group, and those trees that are now fully exposed um, to the brunt of a wind force are now more likely to blow over. Um, so you'd be mimicking that natural disturbance pattern. Okay, so what we talked about a lot, both with Jerry and with David, is the amount of light. And light really is kind of the, the key to all of this, isn't it? In That's the right. eastern United States, we're managing light levels to try to get certain tree species to meet whatever the goals and objectives are of that landowner. That's exactly right. Okay. Yep. Um, shade tolerance is kind of the big, uh, the big key player in all of this. Species have different shade tolerances and can sustain themselves differently in the understories depending on how closed our overstories are. Our shade tolerant species like our red maples and our beaches, which tend to be problematic species for us, folks looking to regenerate oak, they're tolerant, they can kind of exist in these closed canopy conditions, whereas our mid-tolerant species, the majority of our oaks, um, like that kind of partial disturbance, um, some um, opening in the overstory that allows kind of this intermediate life level that are sharing it. Um, enough light to sustain their own growth um, in the industry. So some of the challenges that we are uh, not going to be too surprised with if we encounter them here, we've mentioned already deer, um, we've mentioned that uh, some of the species that are shade tolerance, and, and that's what we see here in the understory, and there's not actually where we're standing a whole lot. Uh, we can uh, reach here, we've got uh, mostly black cherry and red maple. That's right. And uh, red maple in particular is a species that's very shade tolerant. And I think, if I remember right, it's the most common tree in Virginia yeah, in terms of numbers. And in the eastern forest. In the eastern forest. So, yeah. so uh, not that maple, red maple is not a bad tree, but it's so common because of the past uh, use of the land, how it's been used, how it's been harvested or not harvested or not managed. And so uh, we would expect to find a lot of red maple coming back up in here and Again, while it's not necessarily a bad tree intrinsically, the cost of that would be not having the red oak. Yes, and you can make the argument or, that it's... Excuse me, red oak, white oak, whatever oak. Whatever oak you want, yeah. yeah. Um, you can make the argument that it's their numbers are artificially inflated, um, where we would have had a um, periodic natural disturbance regime kind of creating the light conditions that were conducive for oak. We've now removed that disturbance regime, and shade-tolerant species like red maple are able to move in 
um, and fill that void. So their numbers have been pumped up by you. Yeah. Right. Great. Okay. Well, good. Thank you, David. Yeah, Appreciate it. I've got with me Patty Nylander, who's with the Virginia Department of Forestry. She is a senior area forester for this part of Virginia. And uh, Patty, we've been talking uh, with the other two guys about uh, Fennelschlag. It's a type of uh, civil cultural approach to harvesting timber, but it's not just about removing, it's about what's going to be left behind. So this is the first time I've introduced the, the word silviculture. That's silva, meaning tree, and culture, and culturing trees. It's a part of science. But, you know, for the casual drive-by person who looks at a timber harvest happening, um, is a timber harvest the same as civil culture? What, when is it the same? When is it not? Talk to us a little bit about the difference between just a timber harvest and a civil culturally approached timber harvest. Yeah, so some of those timber harvests can take the form of maybe just removing trees, maybe to change the land use. If we necessarily that forestry, that would be a change. Um, but a timber harvest to take place maybe as a clear cut could be civil culture because if we're going to regenerate that stand naturally or artificially by planting trees, um, that is still civil culture. So clear cutting is a viable timber harvest. Some other viable ones that exist are commercial thinnings where you're maybe freeing up more resources for trees to grow, providing more growing space, sunlight, maybe a very important one. Um, so thinning is a good timber harvest. Some timber harvests that do take place that maybe are not um, as beneficial to the forest and not a silvicultural forestry practice are what's called high growth. And that is the idea when you're, you're going through the stands and identifying the, only the best and uh, strongest and, and best quality looking trees or the largest ones and removing all of those at the same time with no regard to what the growth is going to grow up behind that harvest and no regard when trying to remove maybe some of the lower quality timber that exists. So what you're left with is a lower quality stand that's going to reduce your revenues over time and reduce the quality of your stand, not just from a forestry or timber standpoint, but even from a wildlife standpoint. You're removing some of that valuable food source, browse for wildlife. Right, okay. So, you know, uh, some a, a way that I've kind of characterized this in the past, I'll just get your reaction to it, is when people just remove the value from a forest without regard to what the future is, then that's essentially mining a resource, right? You're, you're just extracting something without managing it. So there's a difference between mining and managing. And I think a lot, unfortunately, a lot of what we see is mining, isn't it? In some instances, yes. You know, sometimes that, that higher dollar value is what is ends up being more important. Um, and, and it does kind of set the stand up for the future to just be less valuable and maybe not have the benefits. So that, that a, a forest can provide, a well-managed forest can provide so many benefits. Yeah. You migrate it, you can remove some of those benefits. Right, right. All right, so those are great points. And folks, if you happen to be a landowner and you've uh, harvested your timber with a diameter limit or a high grading, we're not here to, to, uh, to denigrate the choice that you've made. You may have made that uh, as an informed decision or not. It's your land, and you can do what you want with it. But a lot of times, landowners want to do what's right. And so to get there, we always encourage you to work with a, a, a forester, a professional forester. A great place to start is with a local area forester from your area, in your area, with the Department of Forestry. As we wrap things up, I just want to give a quick shout out to the Virginia Tree Farm Program. They are a great partner with us and the Virginia Department of Forestry uh, to uh, support landowner education throughout the state. And they're part of a nationwide organization called the American Forest Foundation. Been around a long time and they do a lot uh, for landowners on the national level, including certifying forest land. So if that's something you're interested in, you might uh, reach out to an extension forester or Department of Forestry near you. And otherwise, I want to encourage you to please tune in next week when my friend and colleague Jason Fisher will be doing a session with 15 Minutes in the Forest on Tree ID in the Piedmont of Virginia. We'll see you then.